from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And here's today's lineup. From Iowa State University, Lee Schultz is featured on this week's cattle market segment. He'll talk about the new Cattle Futures Boxed Beef Index. And he'll go over new information on the continued strength in domestic ground beef demand. Following Lee, then, K-State's Sandy Johnson, talking about why there's added incentive this year for putting those beef bulls through a breeding soundness examination ahead of spring breeding, having to do with the extreme cold weather in February and the possible impact on bull fertility performance. And on this week's 4-H segment, K-State's Shannon Rogie talks with Jeff Wickman about qualifying for the state 4-H shooting sports match. All that here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You are listening to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Welcome once more. For our cattle market segment, we go up the road, if you will, to Ames, Iowa, and talk with livestock economist Lee Schultz of Iowa State University about the cattle trading trends and some recent information that he's pulled together on beef demand from several angles. We'll get into that. Lee, the quick recap of the trade this past week, Fed and feeder cattle. The Fed cash market remains in that pretty tight trading range, doesn't it? It does. Really, you know, we, we've traded flat here for really last six weeks or so. You know, we're we're trading that 113 to 114. Uh, we did see, I, I think, a little bit of strength in, in feeder cattle as, as markets are getting a bit back to normal after, uh, you know, we've we seen that cold weather a couple of weeks ago that definitely impacted receipts. And now I think that's kind of even it out a little bit. But there's been a lot of interesting things going on when you, when you look at the trade. You know, we, we've seen the, the June contract actually above the April contract. That's very counter seasonal to, to what's typical. I think there's some time yet, obviously, to, to see that even back out. Uh, and that'll be something to watch. You know, where do we see the strength? Is it in the April contract or do we see some weakness in June? And basis levels are really kind of counter to what we typically see. Uh, you're seeing fed cattle futures well over the cash market in a time period where there's quite a bit of strength usually in cash prices in, in April and then then again in May. And so, you know, I think there's just some things that are maybe parlaying over from what we had seen a year ago or, you know, what we've seen over the last year. What about boxed beef this past week? That has been a fairly reliable trend as well. What's the latest there? Well, I, I think we're we're in that position of, of finding that bottom in the market. You know, whatever the way you look at it, we we're roughly down about two percent in, in the box beef trade. Again, I think that's we're, we're seeing these larger uh, slaughter levels that that is pressuring beef prices. But we're also transitioning into that ramp up in beef demand, and so I think with the warmer weather that we actually experienced here the, the, this last week. You know, I think that maybe is an indication we could see a, a bit of a warm up earlier, and that that should certainly help beef demand. By the way, something new was introduced in the futures called the Boxed Beef Index. Remind folks what that's about and uh, what its purpose is. Certainly, and, and I think th- this is a really interesting development. So the the Boxed Beef Index w- was launched uh, March eighth by the CME. Now, this index is using publicly reported data that has been reported for some time. It's just in how they're calculating that index. And their calculations are very transparent. It's on their website. But I think the reason or the interest behind it is what needs to be talked about. So right now, there's currently not a tradable product for this index. Um, It's purely from a market understanding price changes over time. But... We've seen this actually back in 2015 
the, the pork cutout index was released by CME. And then this last year on November 9th, they launched the pork cutout contract. And so right now there, there's no indication that we would see a box beef contract, but you can think of this as really the first step in that potentially to see a tradable product from the CME. How can the index be useful now if it is, in fact, a precursor for a boxed beef contract someday? How can a producer or a trader utilize this at this point? Well, I think it's twofold. First, uh, it, like any of the other publicly reported information, like we talk about on a weekly basis, the boxed beef uh, trade gives a good indication of demand. And so looking at those trends week to week, year over year, is a great indication of of that demand. We have a product now that CME is going to release, um, and we can use that as a benchmark. But we could have done that before with with the box beef prices released by USDA Ag Market Service, because that's where this this data is exactly coming from. Now, I think the longer-term question is this index, do we see that as potentially a way for price discovery? And I think that's what we've seen in hogs, where in hogs, there's a percent of those hogs that are sold that's based on a formula for the pork cutting. And so there's an indication where we're using that for price discovery, and now there's a role for that derivative in the marketplace for hedging that risk, both for hog producers as well as buyers, the packers that are ultimately selling pork. Anybody who'd like to know more about the new boxed beef index, which went onto the board here last week, you can go to the CME website to check that out. Recently, Lee, you put together an article on several aspects of beef demand, and we wanted to dig into that a little bit in our conversation here today, including the positive report on ground beef demand. Uh, This data was collected as of 2020, a summary, if you will, and in this past calendar year, ground beef did quite well, you say. It did, and this is another uh, product from USDA's Economic Research Service that crossed my desk, and I found it really interesting to show that uh, the cost of a, a cheeseburger was more expensive in 2020 than it was in 2019. I think you know, given the, the situation we experienced in 2009, that's maybe not that much of a surprise to folks. But, you know, what was a surprise to me it, until I really started digging to the data was this was the highest cost for, for a cheeseburger adjusted for inflation, except for 2015. And many of us, you know, remember 2015, it's very tight beef supplies. So we have much larger supplies, roughly 15% larger supplies in 2015, but actually about the same cost of that cheeseburger. So that translates into very strong demand for ground beef. And really, it it was very strong demand for beef overall in 2020. And uh, that hopefully is carrying over into 2021, but it's still too early to get a gauge on that. Well, and that's really what my target was for this article is we know what we experienced in 2020 for demand. And I think that potentially foreshadows into 2021, but also understanding that, you know, ground beef was really a go-to product in 2021 from a convenience standpoint, just from a, I know how to cook ground beef as we've seen movement from food away from home. But thinking about it, if we kind of see that return to normal, um, that could really even spur demand further because we're not talking necessarily about the high end cuts right now. Ground beef is, is trimming its product and sometimes we do see some cuts ground. But, you know, once we see that potential boost from the higher end cuts, I think that could spur demand even more. How does this reflect then, if you would, Lee, on the cull cow market? Lean beef supplies, as from cold animals, are the, uh, the linchpin for ground beef production. What's that relationship look like? You're exactly right. Cold cows are, are very important in the, the ground beef equation. And, and uh, we don't have enough time to, to understand fully how, how that enters. But, but really, we're mixing trimmings from fed steers and heifers and trimmings from, from cold cows to get the dialed in ground beef products that we all want um, at the grocery store or at the restaurant. Uh, so cold cow values are, are very important there. And I think we've seen strong values last year because of that strong demand for ground beef. 
And now as we enter 2021, we're seeing stronger prices for coal cows because I think we're still seeing that strength in the, the ground beef market. Also realizing we're, we're kind of in that declining inventories for the cow herd too. So those supplies are getting a bit tighter and that's why I think coal cow prices right now are a bit stronger. Forecasts though, I think are a little bit more pessimistic for coal cow values and, and and at least expressing the downside risk in the market. So, so far we've been talking about strength in demand, but you know, where can we see some risk? Well, potentially, you know, do we see maybe not as a robust recovery in the economy as we've seen so far or expect? Well, that, that could soften beef demand and therefore soften coal cow values. And then the supply side of things, maybe we do see an uptick in, in slaughter of cows because feed costs are gonna be a lot more this year. Does that impact those call call values? Maybe weights are going to be a little bit lighter because of those higher feed costs as well. Um, so a lot to think about. But I think right now, if you're marketing call cows, you're seeing rather robust values, at least compared to what you've seen a year ago. All right. And wrapping up, your thoughts on the trades this coming week, which direction you perceive them to take? Well, if, if last week was any indication, I, I think certainly front end, we're looking at some pretty sideways trade. But... We're inching closer to April, and I think April's given us a good indication that we could push over 115 potentially and start to see some strength in the market. That's really predicated on cleaning up these front-end supplies. Uh, But so far, we've seen these rather robust slaughter levels. And so I think all indications are, you know, we're going to push into some seasonally higher prices. How much higher, though, is, is really yet to be seen. Always good input, Lee. We thank you for pulling it together and sharing it with us today, and enjoy the rest of your week. All right. Same to our listeners. Lee Schultz, Livestock Economist, Iowa State University, and a regular contributor to our weekly cattle market segment here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. We're back now on this Agriculture Today. And with further information for you cow-calf producers, with an eye to the spring breeding season, the condition of your bull power, especially coming out of those adverse weather conditions in February. Sandy Johnson is with us. She's a beef cattle specialist, K-State Research and Extension, and based in northwest Kansas. And she's talking up, Sandy, the value of a breeding soundness examination for bulls. And Looking back at February, the deep freeze, the record cold, that very well may have had a negative impact on bulls, right? That's right. You know, we often see years frostbitten on calves, and of course this year we probably have some more severe problems with those newborn calves, but our bulls can also suffer from frostbite damage, and often you know, in the midst of a storm like that, you're certainly worried about those young newborn calves and the bulls or wherever they are. And in some ways we were fortunate that the wind wasn't any higher than it was so that, you know, the wind chill was only in the minus 20 to 30 range and not minus 60. But nevertheless, we can certainly have some frostbite damage. And really the, the older bulls are more likely to be well, one, it's likely that they're not in some nice, cozy place. Somebody with a bunch of yearling bulls, they're going to likely be bedded and prepared for that. But the older bulls, particularly with a really pendulous scrotum, may really be limited to, to what they can even do to protect themselves if there's not adequate bedding and a windbreak. So we need to recognize that as a potential problem and then make sure that You know, it's always important to do a breeding soundness exam, but I think it's going to be even more so this year. 
You note in an article that you put in the recent Beef Tips newsletter out of K-State that the anatomy of the bull, well, it will adjust to temperatures, and it has its limits, though, that range of adjustment. Right. You know, the the bull has what's known as the cremaster muscle that essentially raises and lowers the scrotum to regulate that temperature. And the temperature, we want the temperature where we're producing the sperm to be lower than the core body temperature. And so lower, yes, but not not frozen. So, you know, just frostbite can cause swelling and inflammation. And that's really similar in terms of sperm production to something if if the bull had a, a foot rot and developed a fever or something else to cause an elevation in body temperature, we would interfere with that sperm production process it just can't carry on at higher temperatures or, you know, again, in extreme low temperatures beyond what the body can regulate. Interesting historical note here, again, in that same article, Sandy, the concept of a breeding soundness examination for beef bulls actually was inspired by adverse weather, not unlike what we're talking about here. Right. In the winter of 48 and 49, Actually, they had some good storms in in the fall, but then January hit this really big three-day blizzard, and, you know, they had a lot more snow and, and I think, higher wind speeds, so lower wind chills. And that's really what got some of our theriogenologists looking at, well, we better evaluate these bulls because probably there were very obvious issues that could be seen with inflammation. And, you know, those snow drifts in that storm were 20 and 30 feet deep. You know, probably they're lucky in some cases that they weren't if they weren't buried under it. But mm-hmm. reviewing some of that history made you think, well, yes, it was cold, but we did, <laughs> it, it could have been worse. You bet. Uh, another landmark was in 1964, but this illustrated truly how frostbite directly can impact the beef bull and in very definitive terms. Right. I never found anything written up on the 49 storm in terms of bulls particularly, but some of those are reported in another paper that look at response of bulls in 1964. And a commonly cited piece of data out of there is that bulls that had severe frostbite, close to 90% of those then failed a breeding soundness exam. Hmm. And those that were kind of in a moderate category, which unless you were one of the people scoring those, I'm not sure how to describe those to you, but whatever that was moderate in what they had in front of them, you know, roughly half of those passed, quarter of them were questionable, quarter of them failed, you know. Hmm. So I would have to think that we would have a number of bulls in that moderate category this year. And it's not uncommon to have some level of scabbing that's apparent at the bottom of the scrotum, but particularly I think for producers even further south that aren't used to the cold that they got, just like they're energy system wasn't ready for it. Perhaps producers weren't either. So it's just really important to have those bulls examined. And, you know, that breeding soundness exam should involve a a physical evaluation, you know, eyes, feet, legs, make sure that it can fully extend, no warts or wrong attachments. You can really palpate that scrotum, measure the scrotal size, you know, often with a severe frostbite damage, then there'll be some adhesions and the testes will not move normally in that scrotal sac. So those are important parts of it. And then that semen evaluation, not only looking at motility, but uh, the morphology in particular. And of course, the morphology is the shape of those sperm cells and the motility is how they move. We want them to be moving forward and not often you'll see them moving in a circle, but you want forward linear movement, uh, good, healthy semen. A question that does come up, how soon should that BSE take place? And there is a standard for waiting until the just appropriate time to do so, right? Right. The sperm cells are stored in the epididymis, which is at the lower part of the scrotum. And if it was a, a moderate frostbite then, and only the storage portion was damaged, then maybe in 45 days you could 
evaluate those. But generally, that whole process is a 60-day process. So probably waiting till that point is is best if you think you, your bulls might be impacted. And, of course, you know, there's where we are this year and where your breeding season starts, that might put you a little close on finding other bulls. But that's what the math figures out. You can check them early, and if they're fine, they're fine. And a lot of times... If we check too early, or too early, they're questionable, and you know we don't want to discard a bull if we don't have to. We generally don't like to bring him back and test him again if we don't have to. So that's the type of trade-off we have. That test, though, should be on the docket with your veterinarian. That should be right. scheduled any time now. Yes, and you know a lot of practitioners will have special days and maybe multiple days where they're testing bulls and that's a great advantage to them from the standpoint of the time it takes to set up and you know I, I would certainly look for those and take advantage of them if you if you can and you know recognize that it doesn't always fit this the schedule of you know some of the challenges that we just talked about in terms of the start of the breeding season and other things but I think the practitioners really work hard to help producers by providing this service and you know, even if we had the luxury of 10 bulls in front of us and we could select those with the best morphology, we, we probably would help our pregnancy rates and even calving distribution as you look at some of the data. Now, we can't always <laughs> in that situation, but the things we're examining are important to fertility and outcome. And so take advantage of the screening that we can do. And just to cap this off, you cite some information from a national survey that indicates uh, the percentage of producers checking bulls via a BSE ahead of spring breeding is lower than one might imagine. Right. You know, it, the statistic is higher if it's a new bull into the your herd. But uh, in terms of each bull every year, that's pretty low. And, and particularly for the smaller producers, it's it's very low, and when you think about, you know, sometimes more bulls can cover up a problem, but if, if you have fewer bulls, then that problem can really be exposed. Yeah. We don't have calves to sell. we got a problem. Indeed. Producers, give this due consideration. Moreover, talk with your practitioner about getting your bull battery lined up for a breeding soundness examination, and that's accentuated even more this year with that horribly cold weather that we endured in February and the impact that might have brought to bear on the bull fertility. Sandy, good message. Thanks for passing that along to us. Glad to be here. That from Research and Extension Beef Cattle Specialist Sandy Johnson. You might want to take a look at that article that Sandy put together on this topic of bull fertility and issues possibly from frostbite in the recent Beef Tips newsletter that's found at ksubeef.org. This is the Monday edition of Agriculture Today. When we come back after this break, we'll have today's agricultural news headlines for you. And Jeff Wickman is awaiting with this week's Kansas 4-H feature. So again, please keep it right here on the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to Agriculture Today from Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson with you. And next up, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, farmers and ranchers have expressed skepticism about a forthcoming push for climate change proposals, and their views were echoed in a Senate Agriculture Committee hearing last Thursday on the climate situation. Senate Ag Committee Ranking Member John Boozman of Arkansas noted his concerns that carbon credits will not benefit farmers significantly nor broadly enough. 
This may be a potential income stream for some producers, but for others, it could be cost prohibitive, according to Boozman. He expressed concern that Democrats would use the budget reconciliation process to pass a climate bill backed by the president and Ag Committee Chair Debbie Stabenow with minimal or no Republican support. Boozman highlighted how the chicken, beef, and dairy industries have increased production with a significantly reduced environmental impact over recent decades. He noted how new opportunities to compensate farmers for these environmental gains do hold promise, but he cautioned that there are costs associated with verification, with validation, technical services, new technologies and equipment, and oftentimes costs associated with reduced yields. These costs add up and can become prohibitive, he said. For this new opportunity to be viable for producers, he said the benefits must outweigh the risks and the costs that they take on. The EPA's past 2018 dicamba registration decision was tainted by political interference and ignored important science on the herbicide's risks. This according to an internal EPA email that DTN obtained and has verified with the agency. The new acting assistant administrator for the EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, Michael Friedhoff, sent that email a week ago. The email highlights the agency's 2018 dicamba registrations of Extendamax herbicide of Bayer, BASF's Ingenia, herbicide and Corteva's Fixapan herbicide as an example of what they're calling political interference. Friedhoff wrote that in 2018, that office had directed staff to rely on limited data uh, from a set of plant effects endpoints and discount specific studies used in assessing potential risks and benefits, as well as discounting scientific information on the negative impacts, as she said. It's not immediately clear what the EPA's new view of its 2018 dicamba registrations will mean for how the agency would manage its most recent dicamba re-registrations released in October of last year for Extendamax, Ingenia, and Tavium out of Syngenta. The EPA also granted a new registration to Corteva's Fixapan, but that company has opted to discontinue that. Now, last Monday, Friedhoff told a conference of pesticide regulators that the agency is facing multiple lawsuits over those new registrations, and in an effort to be able to defend them in court, the EPA is not allowing states to use Section 24C special local needs labels to either restrict or expand those labels. At that conference, Friedhoff hinted that the agency may reevaluate its 2020 dicamba registrations at the end of this growing season. What might corn and soybean growers expect regarding margins and break-even prices for this upcoming growing season? A former K-State agricultural economist offers his take on that in this report from the USDA's Rod Bain. What might margins look like for corn and soybean producers this year? Purdue University's Michael Lingemeyer offered projections at this year's Commodity Classic, starting with net farm income. Net farm income per acre is projected to be the highest since 2012. And because of that, one of the things we want to do is try to protect those margins as much as possible. And so coming up with a marketing plan and carefully thinking through our crop insurance choices is very important. Declining break-even prices for both corn and beans should continue this year. For corn, the break-even price is slightly under $4 per bushel. That's another reason why 2021 looks so strong compared to some recent years. It's a combination of relatively strong projected prices, but also lower break-even prices than what we saw a few years ago. And for soybeans, the break-even price is now right around $9.75. And so you combine that $9.75 with a projected price around $11.50 for this fall, and there's a possibility of very strong earnings. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Elsewhere in the headlines today, the pork supply chain in the U.S. would face significant disruption in 2022 when California's Proposition 12 takes effect. That's a new report from Rabobank. As of January the 1st of next year, Proposition 12 will prohibit the sale of pork not produced according to California's production standards. Proposition 12 applies to any uncooked pork sold in the state, regardless of whether it was raised in California or not. 
Proposition 12 forbids the sale of whole pork meat in California from hogs born of sows not housed in conformity with the law. At the end of this year, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, the end of last year, that is, that court rejected a motion for an injunction against the law. Agriculture groups in 20 states are challenging the law, alleging that it violates the Commerce Clause. The North American Meat Institute and the U.S. Department of Justice requested an in-bank hearing before all of the judges in the Ninth Circuit. Oral arguments in that case set for April the 14th. Now, Rabobank said in its report that the U.S. pork industry faces a daunting task to comply with Proposition 12 if the legal challenge comes up short. They say that with less than 4 percent of the U.S. sow housing currently able to meet the new standard, Rabobank expects a shortfall in compliant pork in the U.S. market, leaving California with a severe pork deficit and high prices, while generating a surplus in the rest of the U.S. market, according to that report. The National Pork Producers Council and the American Farm Bureau Federation will also be giving oral arguments in that lawsuit filed against the state of California. And Kansas City motorists will have more fuel choices at the pump thanks to an EPA decision announced late last week that allows the year-round sale of E15, 15% ethanol fuel, in the Kansas City metro area. The EPA removed a regulation that previously banned the sale of E15 in that region. The Kansas Corn Growers Association and Missouri Corn Growers Association staffs worked closely with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, and the EPA to allow year-round E15 sales. Kansas Corn and Missouri Corn worked with their state agencies on modern Modeling studies and those studies in both states showed no ozone exceedances expected to occur in the Kansas City metro due to E15 use. According to a recent USDA study, ethanol results in 43 percent fewer greenhouse gas emissions than gasoline. Increasing ethanol blending from 10 to 15 percent further reduces GHG emissions. That's a look at today's agricultural news headlines after the break. We'll hand it on over to Jeff Wickman for this week's 4-H segment. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Welcome back and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. After having the spring state shooting sports match canceled a year ago due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Kansas 4-H Youth Program Coordinator Shannon Rogge says that youth are currently competing to qualify for this year's event, which is scheduled for May 1st in Great Bend. Shannon, for those involved in the shooting sports area, they're getting down to crunch time in order to get qualified for the state match. That is correct. They have been working on qualifying matches, which are matches held at the local units that give them a chance to earn qualifying scores for the state match. They've been working on those since, oh, the beginning of February, and they have a couple more weeks left for these matches before the qualifying season closes. So some have already qualified and others are maybe still trying to qualify? Correct. Yep, and these matches are all spread out through the state, so kind of depends where the timing is for their local match, too. They might have traveled around trying to make sure they got a qualifying score, or they might be waiting for the one that's right in their county and confident that they will will make it in one match. And for this, we're talking BB gun, air rifle, and air pistol. Is that right? That's correct. That is our what we consider our spring season, which is those three, those will go on to our spring state match. We do have other state matches in the fall that we consider our fall season, but we are are focused on those three at the moment. In terms of getting qualified then, is the process the same? Do they have to have the same type scores or is it different between each of the areas? It is different for each discipline. This is determined by where advisory thinks that these groups 
you know, if we have a lot of kids that are qualifying, they might look at, at raising the score just to make sure they are pushing the kids and encouraging them to be improving themselves. So those scores can fluctuate a little bit. And we always announce those in the rules prior to season. And then they are different for every discipline. So they have to know their specific rules when they go in and shoot for their discipline before they get there. And this is all target shooting, is that right? Correct. This is all target shooting. These three disciplines, the matches are hosted inside, usually in gymnasiums. And they set up their their targets and their little range inside. So it's a really good project for those during the winter months and when it's cold out because they can still practice all year. Probably should mention for those that are in the shooting sports areas, they receive a lot of training before they actually even start the process. Absolutely. And we we have a training program for our volunteers before they go back to the county level and train the youth. So it is a very structured process to make sure that everyone is safe and is meeting those minimum standards. These certified instructors are the backbone of our program, and they go back to the county and they teach the youth, and those youth have to make sure they are safe on the line, on the firing line, meet the requirements before they are considered safe to go to a match on their own. Um, They have to be signed off to even go. So those are all standards that they have to meet, and they learn a lot along the way. The competition is one thing, but putting in the hours of practice is probably the other part that maybe we don't always see before they get to that competition level. Absolutely. There are a lot of programs that practice, a lot of them practice once a week. Some of them are even practicing twice a week, every week in the evenings to make sure that they are honing their skills and accomplishing the goals that they want to. You mentioned that the qualifying matches are taking place through most of this month. After that, the state match then will be held in Great Bend on May 1st. Yep. So we close off our qualifying season March 27th. Um, I believe our last scheduled match at this point is March 21st. Once that closes, they will know based on their qualifying scores if they are able to go to state. And then we will see everyone at state May 1st in Great Bend this year moving it around a little bit since the past. And we did not have the 2020 spring match, so we are extra excited to have everyone back in person this year and have the event. I imagine that there are a lot of youth that will qualify for this event. Are there any protocols that people need to be made aware of in terms of the state match then? Absolutely. We will be following our normal key state COVID protocols, social distancing, mask wearing, and sanitizing everything while we are there. And then the families that do register, they will receive extra reminders and extra information to make sure they are prepared so that the event can run smoothly. And then those who do well at the state match have a chance to go to the nationals? Yes. So this is kind of our progression, local matches to state matches, and then they have the opportunity to go to nationals and be part of the Kansas team, represent Kansas. The nationals is held in June every year in Grand Island, Nebraska, and there are a lot of kids that are very competitive and compete, you know, head-to-head to gain a spot for that national team. So everyone looks forward to knowing, figuring out at the end of the day who is qualified to go to Nebraska. Do some youth cross over between the disciplines, or do they primarily concentrate on just BB gun, air rifle, or air pistol? There's quite a few that cross over. And there's also a handful that, you know, they focus on one, um, and that's what they become an expert in. So it really just depends on from program to program and family to family. So some youth may be participating in a couple of events for both the state and possibly nationals. So for state, yep, they do have the opportunity to compete in several disciplines. When they go to nationals, they are required to pick their top discipline. So if they qualify in multiple disciplines for nationals, they have to make a decision and let us know which is the most important discipline for them. You mentioned that there is one event in the spring and then three in the fall. So if someone is interested in getting into the shooting sports area, what should they do? They should contact their local office, their local 4-H agent. And first of all, Make sure that there is an active program in their county with a certified instructor. 
And if not, we certainly do try to get them paired up with maybe a neighboring county that also has a certified instructor that they can go practice with over there. And then just discussing, you know, what disciplines are offered, what they're interested in, and finding the right fit for them. That's Kansas 4-H Youth Program Coordinator Shannon Rogge with an update on upcoming state qualifying shooting sports events. The Spring State Shooting Sports Match is being held in Great Bend on May 1st. Again, for more information, contact your local county or district extension office or visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.